Welcome everyone um, today to the first walk workshop of Oak Camper 2021. Um, happy to welcome you. I'm Randa Anderson, and this workshop is entitled The Diacono Post COVID Rescue Response. And our speakers today will begin with Dr. Helen Theodoropoulos. Um, a dear friend of mine and a wonderful instructor. She is a professor at St. Slava Serbian Orthodox School of Theology in Libertyville, Illinois. She also generously offers her gifts and talents to our parish at St. Peter and Paul, leading uh, many Bible studies and adult education. Next, we'll speak Dr. D. Jacquet who is a CPE training supervisor and spiritual director and a retired pastoral counselor, hospice and hospital chaplain, and professor of religious studies. And I will add, I believe, a past president of Oak Camper, and I think I heard one of the founding members also. And um, the third speaker of this workshop will be Deacon Salvatore Fazio who is a, has been the Diaconate Program Director of Outreach for Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Massachusetts. He is also an electrical engineer. So uh, another interesting science and um, theology combination. All right. Thank you, Helen. You want to get started? All right. I thank you all for the opportunity to be here to present. Um, fathers, friends, colleagues, deacons to the rescue. COVID illuminated the need for us to connect and work together, to be one body that lives as one in Christ. When first it hit, it isolated us. We were forced physically to be separate from one another. And that physical isolation quickly led to emotional isolation and even spiritual distance. We felt the loss that we were losing each other and even ourselves. But in that itself, we learned how much we really needed each other, how much we missed each other. We became acutely and newly aware of the need to find ways to connect, to care for each other, to uphold, help, and hold one another. In their presentations, oh, so this, okay, so, um, Dee and Deacon Sal will po powerfully describe the needs that became clear through the pandemic, the ways in which we rose to meet those needs, and the ministry within the life of the church that we can mobilize for meeting these needs more fully. And that ministry is the diaconate. Isolation, estrangement, division, anger, fear, and hopelessness. These are places where wounded people need health care workers, but also more than what health care workers can provide. These wounds may manifest in physical or psychological illness, but speak to deeper spiritual injuries that require, in addition to healthcare workers, the connection and communion that overcomes and heals. This is the communion which God offers to us in Christ through his body, the church. And we offer this communion in our service to one another, and the deacon or deaconess offers this service as the embodiment of Christ, the servant, and the church in the world. And today we will explore how the ordained deaconate is the arm of the church for this work in the world. Before Dee and Deacon Sal present the more concrete ways in which deacons can serve, I'd like to present a few basic truths about the diaconate to provide a firm foundation for today's discussion. 
Over the last several decades, and especially the last 20 years, much has been written about the history, purpose, and function of the diaconate, and that pertains to both the male and the female diaconate. We will identify certain truths about the diaconate that reflect an established consensus. And that will enable us to see the ways in which the diaconate works for the unity and life of the truth, uh, excuse me, life of the church. These foundational truths are that it is, and it's true for male and female diaconate, that it is ancient, necessary, a distinct ministry, ordained, liturgical and pastoral, but in both arenas, focusing on service. It has been the subject of multiple calls for reinvigoration, and very important to understand, it is not in competition with either the ordained clergy of the priesthood or the episcopacy, or in particular, I don't want us to see it as in um, competition with lay ministries, but rather these all work together for the body of Christ. Ancient. The diaconate is ancient. It belongs to the earliest origins of the church as part of the threefold ordained ministry of the church. We see the earliest presence of the diaconate male and female in the New Testament uh, scriptures, in the writings of the fathers, in the iconography of the church, in the hymnography of the church, in the collective memory of the church, in fact, throughout the whole holy tradition of the church. We know that Acts 6 is recorded as the first presence of the deacons uh, where they are ordained. Um, that could get into all of the little scholarly discussions of what that ordination was, etc. But the collective understanding of the church is this is where the diaconate originated, the very first level of the life of the church. And in fact, also, the first female diaconos is mentioned, Phoebe, in uh, Romans. We have testimony from some of the earliest ch church fathers and documents. Um, Ignatius of Antioch talking about the uh, faithful Christians are to be one with the bishop and the presbyters and the deacons who with them have been appointed, and the Greek word there is the same word we use for ordained, by the intention of Jesus Christ to establish them in accordance with his own will, in security by the Holy Spirit. We have testimony in the early church, Christian church orders, about the male and the female diaconate. And in the Byzantine Fathers, we have a clear assessment that this has been ancient uh, uh, aspect of the ordained clergy from the beginning. The deacon is ordained with the ordination of the clergy, categorized as clergy with the priest and bishop. This is true for both the male and the female diaconate. Unlike the lower orders, this is not through just a simple blessing, but through a full ordination. The ministry of the diaconate uh, is distinct, distinct. It is not preliminary to nor a diminished form of the priesthood, but rather stands distinct in offering the charisma of service, and really to be the embodiment of Christ the servant in his ministry to the world. And I love this quote by St. Ignatius. Uh, I'm about 110, by the way. He lived very early in the life of the church. I exhort you, be eager to do everything in God's, God's harmony with the bishop presiding in the place of God 
and the presbytery, the priests, in the place of the council of the apostles, and the deacon, most sweet to me, entrusted with the service of Jesus Christ. Uh, did I go back? Ordained time? Okay. I think I got a little bit mixed up. Here we go. All right. Um... All right. I, I'm missing my slide where it says, uh, can you go back one just to see if I was both liturgical and pastoral? Okay. Ordained, move forward. We're a little bit, here we go. Thank you. Somehow I missed this one. Thanks. Thanks, Deacon Sal. All right. The ministry of the diaconate is both liturgical and pastoral. And both, you have to understand both of these are focused around the idea of service, whether he's uh, chanting hymns uh, and responses in the liturgy or um, uh, assisting the poor in the community. They are both focused on service. Yes, they assist in worship and sacraments. And we saw that with both male and female deacons, um, but they, are, they were different. They had different functions, but they both were able to assist in various ways. Care for the poor, sick, sick, elderly, dying, catechesis, they did education, do education, preaching, evangelism, administration, youth ministry. This is not an exhaustive list. It goes on. All right. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Now we're on, back on schedule here. Uh, over the last hundred years, there have many calls for the renewal, especially of the female diaconate, but also for the reinvigoration of the male diaconate. And we really understand that the two go hand in hand, to understand how the diaconate is essential and that we are not fully living as a, our church in the world without a vigorous, energized diaconate. Um, and so we see both statements uh, relate to these calls for the restoration and reinvigoration of the male and female diaconate. We know that this ministry is the church going into the world to meet the needs of a suffering humanity. Both those who are within the body of Christ and those who are still seeking him. It's the work of Christ the servant. And we go back to scripture itself where Christ is telling us, <laughs> the Son of Man also came not to be served. In the same word, of course, is a root word. Uh, it's related to the word for deacon. Not to serve, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. The needs are many. The workers are few. Within this work of service, we need both lay and ordained ministries not to see each other as somehow competing or you know terminating one another but actually as upholding and working together um, we are a church of abundance right we are a church of love the grace and power of the holy spirit conferred in the mystery of ordination to the diaconate of women and men this infinite abundance can reach deep into the lives of all through this grace, received in the sacrament of ordination, the deacon or deaconess is transformed to be the dedicated servant, anointed agent of the church, the embodiment of the servanthood of Christ to the world, the person who is the visible face and hand and voice and touch, right? of the church reaching into the community to meet the needs of the people. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dee and, and then Deacon Sal to talk about these concrete needs that came up in COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. 
Thank you, Deacon Sal, for running my videos for me. Welcome. It's so good to have you here. The COVID pandemic, as most of us know, has created a new reality marked by loss and spiritual distress. It has challenged attitudes about God, altered people's priorities, and created a need for spiritual reassurance. For most people, it has been painful to give up the illusion that we have control over our lives. We felt anxiety and spiritual distress because we lacked the spiritual renewal of receiving the sacraments and were unable to meet friends and family for reassurance. COVID awakened us to our basic need not just for human interaction, but also personal spiritual support and community. The COVID crisis also revealed needs and gaps in the Church's ministry, illuminating a lack that has been present and felt by many, but which kept getting denied, that our current strategies for one-on-one spiritual care are not sufficient to address the needs and wounds of our faithful. This reality serves as a prophetic witness to how the Church might better minister both now and into the future. We need to recover and re-energize the orders of the ordained male and female diaconate to help fill the gaps. Through our COVID experiences, we've learned some new lessons about how to be a community. Laypersons spontaneously join clergy in active outreach, offering practical assistance such as running errands and buying groceries for others. Through sustained personal relationship, isolated people experience somebody who cares and who shares in trusting that God will help us pass through this difficult time. We found out that we really need each other. We also discovered with crystal clarity the pain of discouragement and doubt, not to mention grief over the thousands who became ill and died. The pandemic forced us to think creatively about partnering differently within the Church in order to address the need for personal spiritual companionship. Now we must ask ourselves, how can we continue to do more? An expanded diaconate can provide the priest and his parish with a readiness and resilience for meeting pastoral and spiritual care needs, calling on the presence and action of the Holy Spirit to heal us more deeply than we can heal ourselves. Too often we see people struggling to devise schemes for satisfaction, success, and power until they're exhausted, trying to survive by their own strategies for happiness. But survival is not the same as rescue. By our Lord Jesus Christ's grace and example, Orthodox Christians have long been taught to face life's adversities with our survival training of prayer, compassion, and the resolute strength of love. In the end, we find that rescue belongs to dependence on our Lord. The unique healing which can be offered through the Church goes beyond the mending available from visits by well-meaning friends and surpasses referral to professional therapists and social workers. The Church offers more. Why is this so? The Paschal message is a call to each of us to bring our wounds and doubts to the cross and crucify them with Christ. This process can be difficult and can take an agonizingly long time. Ultimately, it requires the sacrifice of the self-serving ego's convictions of privilege over others and the sacrifice of personal comfort over service to community. God's healing power is found in the journey toward reuniting our soul with our loving source and creator. Most people need the Church's assistance to grow into this way of living and to stay on course when the going gets rough. Of course, there is a time and a place for for professional therapy and medical intervention when appropriate. However, the healing presence of the Holy Spirit within the Church offers divine therapy which surpasses professional therapies. My son Christopher is on the emergency search and rescue team in Telluride, Colorado, a ski resort town high up in the Rocky Mountains. 
He can tell many stories of crises and disasters he's seen and attended to. Some skiers and hikers are injured or die accidentally, even with the best training and preparation. Others venture into the mountains with no preparation, witlessly wandering straight into danger. The call to the church is the same as that of a search and rescue team. Prepare, with God's help, for any emergency. Be sensitive to distress calls. Assist those in spiritual crisis, whatever their circumstance. Do what you can to stem the suffering, stabilize the wound, and bring them out of isolation and back into a healing community. While spiritual distress has always existed, this pandemic has helped us to see it more realistically in the forefront of our work, and we cannot lose those lessons. People sometimes ask me, what do you think about diaconal ministry in the Orthodox Church? And my answer is, I think it would be a good idea. (laughs) What I mean is that in recent times, a deacon has usually been uh, thought of to be just a liturgical assistant, or sometimes deacons participate actively in community ministry, but quite commonly people perceive ordination to the diaconate to be just a required step on the road to priestly ordination. We can move beyond such limitations with an expanded scope of service for trained diaconal ministry by partnering with more of our people to address pastoral care needs. Also, we have many parishioners who are already trained and functioning in spiritual caregiving professions, such as chaplaincy, pastoral counseling, and spiritual direction. Such parishioners could bring their professional insights and their experience with them as a boon to their diaconal training. Liturgical training and pastoral skills are certainly important for a deacon, yet all ministry is really about grace. God's grace is the very foundation of ordained ministry in the Church. Diaconal ministry differs from professional caregiving ministries because deacons embrace constant prayer and walk with the parishioner within the fullness of the Church. Such ministry carries with it implicit trust. Diaconal ministry blessed and ordained within the Church is under the authority of a bishop and is filled with the grace of the Holy Spirit. As Orthodox Christians, we believe in two important marks which distinguish the ministry of the ordained from that of lay ministry in general. First, there is a specific divine grace which heals and which overcomes the infirmities of those who are being ordained imparted at ordination and remaining with the ordained throughout life. A second distinguishing mark is the spiritually binding relationship of the servant deacon to the one being served as committed love, sacrificial and undying. This requires deep spiritual maturity where one has developed the capacity of the heart for agape love and offers that love in a proper way that is committed and lasting. The heart's commitment to sacrificial service is perhaps the most important aspect of formation for ordination. A re-energized, expanded diaconal ministry of both males and females is a way for the Church to call forth a full complement of spiritual search and rescue teams who bear these distinctive marks of ordained ministry. Women's pastoral ministries are needed as well as men's. In this post-COVID high-stress reality, the special gifts of the female gender, as witnessed by all the women saints and the Mother of God, must be lifted up for the blessing of their unique worth. The flame of the Holy Spirit in women must not be quenched or squandered, nor snuffed into oblivion by fearful or hard-hearted people. The gift of God's love through the presence of healing feminine compassion is not meant for women alone, but for all humankind. Occasionally, when someone in a parish asks the question, why should we spend time talking about women's callings and service to the Church when there are so many other pressing needs to attend to? My response is this. I calculate I have done at least 30,000 hours of pastoral ministry in the last 30 years. What if my own 30,000 hours of service multiplied by, let's say, 1,000 additional women in social and pastoral ministries 
could have been blessed within the church instead of given outside the church to the professional and ecumenical communities. Wouldn't that 30 million hours of women's service within the church go a long way toward making a difference with our pressing needs? Women constitute at least half of the church's pastoral care resources, so far untapped. COVID spiritual distress has awakened a new sense that the church must not overlook half of its precious pastoral resources, just because the calling to serve is manifested in a female body. Yes, the need is pressing, but the outpouring of the Spirit is more than equal to the task. As it stands currently, women are fulfilling their callings to ministry as best as they can. Hundreds are already providing pastoral care and chaplaincy ministries in pluralistic settings. But they have been forced by some people's fears to give their service to the world outside the Church. Must the Church be hampered by the chronic naysayers who undermine women in pastoral ministry doing the work of Christ? It is easy for people to sit back and criticize others behind their backs or remotely by Internet. Such persons threaten the harmony of the Church with their persistent complaints and rationalize their disruptive behavior by insisting that their intent is to, quote-unquote, protect holy tradition. In contrast, it is entirely different to unremittingly commit your own life to the work of the Holy Spirit, in open-hearted symphony with the Church's mission, in order to enrich, enrich the lives of God's children and support their salvation. All people are in need of compassionate and appropriate pastoral attention, whether they are compelled by fear or love. Yet which of the following seems more in keeping with the overall mission of the Church to rescue and restore souls to God, especially at this time of heightened spiritual crisis, to withhold more ministry in order to protect doubters who harbor imagined specters of danger, or to expand ministry to serve faithfully with respectful discernment and sacred obedience under the Holy Spirit's guidance. If we want God's will to manifest, we can cherish neither for nor against, but must instead plant ourselves deep in the longing for the Holy Spirit's presence and action, not just in ourselves, but in our entire community. Individual certainty is no replacement for faith. Recovery from the nightmare of COVID invites the whole Church to open our minds and hearts more deeply to Christ's undying love and to witness how the Holy Spirit will actualize the potentials of her diaconal ministries throughout our community of faith. Will we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, who is revealing a path toward a higher good for the entire Church, a path with fidelity to the past, and creative new hope for the present and future. Reclaiming the diaconate as the ministry which forms a bridge between formal worship and community contributes to the fullness of the Church. It offers an invitation to men and women, including our retired mature elders, to live out their calling to the fullest within the Church. We can make a modest beginning by identifying those persons who discern a calling for pastoral ministry and encouraging them to ask for their priest's recommendation and to apply for diaconal training. A deaconess training program could overlap in most areas with that for our long-term deacons. The ministries of ordained deacon and deaconess must not be left mired down in disuse or buried under the rubble of antiquity. Such neglect of spirit has been relegated to the past by COVID. We have experienced a wake-up call that spiritual search and rescue teams are needed now. We need not settle for triage when we can call forth an entire team of healers bearing Christ's love. The fruits of our orthodox routines of spiritual survival training are called into action. 
Christian preparedness and vigilance demand that we respond to the emergency alert. The hurting and the wounded are waiting. We can populate and equip more spiritual rescue teams through the help and grace of our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, with the blessing of His Church. We can prayerfully engage in dialogue together to discern, plan, prepare, and deploy our ministries. We must pray together that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide us in beneficial practices that give spiritual aid to God's children and glory to His name. To quote 2 Corinthians 6.2, Now is the accepted time. Are you ready? Thank you, Dee. Your eminences, your graces, all clergy, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, I thank you for allowing me the honor of speaking with you today. Before I begin, I would like to say that these are my views, and I am speaking as an individual and not in any official capacity. I'm also warning you that I have ADHD and a Boston accent. For those of you who don't know me, I would like to give some context to why I love discussing the male and female diaconate. And it would be great if my slide went. Of course, that's not going to happen. <clears throat> and of course, that goes down. Technical difficulties. Let's see if I can get this. And if not, I will just read it. Service is not easy, let me tell you. <clears throat> Here we go. But I don't know if my mouse is going to switch it. That would be too easy. Do you mind, uh, actually, Helen, do you mind hitting my slides for me? I would appreciate it. Thank you. All you do is hit forward when I give you a nod. Forward button right there. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. I grew up in a Roman Catholic <clears throat> church that had a married deacon serving. From my youth, my mom and dad taught me, by example, to serve the church out of love and to seek no thank you. As a Roman Catholic Eucharistic minister, I stood with other men and women all at, <clears throat> all at the altar and behind the priest at liturgy. I witnessed the positive impact that men and women who administered communion at liturgy and also during visitations to those in need had on the clergy and the community. After hearing the call to be a deacon, I decided to enroll in the Roman Catholic Diaconate Formation Program. Within weeks of preparing my application, my prayer to serve was answered in God's way. I met this beautiful, faithful, and strong Greek woman who introduced me to Orthodoxy and rescued me. The fullness of faith that Orthodoxy offers was so apparent to me, I embraced it quickly when we were married in the church. I discussed my diaconate calling with my priest 
and Hierarch and received his blessing to attend the diaconate program at Hellenic Cross, Holy, at H Hellenic College, Holy Cross in Brookline, Mass. I completed the program and was ordained to the diaconate in 2009. So here I am, decades later, after saying yes to God's call to be a deacon, humbly asking all those who are reading, listening, or watching today to pray about being part of the diaconate discussion in the Orthodox Church. What does it mean to be a member of the church's pastoral care, search, and rescue team? Presented is a simple organizational chart that indicates a successful team structure to search, rescue, and to serve others feeling lost and in need in the secular world. It takes leaders with great communication skills, preparation areas, and organizers whose gifts and skill sets are utilized in an effective and an efficient manner. It also indicates the three major areas where men and women provide service on the ground, in the air, and in the water. If we cross-reference this secular world org chat to the church's general org chat, we can see a correlation between the two. This org chat is centered around service. However, it is based on the mission of the church to make disciples of all nations so all God's children may have a relationship with him and come to know his grace, love, mercy, and saving, rescuing power. We see in the center of this org chat that the pastoral care search and rescue teams are vital to that mission. We have hierarchs to guide and lead us through holy councils. We communicate with each other and use orthodox social media. We have churches as heavenly spaces where our priests help us prepare our heart, mind, and soul to love God with our free will and feel his love as we discern his will for us. And yes, the church is there for us, whether we are on the ground, in the air, or in the water. Our beloved priests are the boots on the ground search team leaders that bless the rescue. There are so many lost sheep today, especially due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, that make the search effort exhausting and difficult to lead to a rescue. The question is, Uh, go, go, uh, that was the priest, the cross reference, a beloved priest should be next. We'll get the hearts of the priest again. There we go. We'll get a little animation. And it'll, it'll be next. It'll come up next. It'll come up next. And now we should, uh, right there. Good. Our beloved priests are the boots on the ground search team leaders. I think I already said that. Here's my ADHD going. The question is, should priests, that's it, that is correct slide. The question is, should priests do both the pastoral search team work and all the rescue team work? We see in the proposed org chat that these are separate tasks. Certainly, the priest can and does do both from the perspective of searching for those in need and offering a sacred rescuing blessing. But should they do all the rescuing effort that leads up to that blessing? There's a saying I like to use in my business when approaching a project and assigning team tasks. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I shift project task assignments based on the skill sets, pay, schedule, and time management abilities of each team member. If a priest could spend a majority of his time on the search team and less time on the rescue team, it could provide him with a more manageable schedule that benefits him, his family, and the community. After all, the rescue team member's job is to lead the lost person back to the priest for his counsel and blessing that only he is ordained to give. Today, Orthodox healthcare professionals, such as those of you gathered here or watching, are already commonly recognized and respected 
as being on the rescue team by the priest and are in his network. He knows he can count on these dedicated people and their rescue team help allows him to have a healthier schedule and to search out others in need more effectively. What I am identifying is that in, in conjunction with dedicated healthcare professionals, I believe the ordained deacon is an instrumental and unique part of the pastoral rescue team, specifically because they meet the qualifications of a deacon in the Holy Bible, are ordained, and have dedicated their whole life to Christ our God. I believe deacons, as one of the major orders of the church, are meant to help be a unique bond between the laity standing or in the pews and the priests behind the icon screen. Wait. This is why I encourage male and female individuals discerning to be a deacon candidate to listen to God's call to serve the church and act upon it, to humbly let their priest and hierarch know about their calling and not be afraid of their loving guidance, to embrace that guidance, whether the answer is a blessing to seek candidacy for ordination or guidance to serve the church in other ways somewhere else on the church's org chart. In St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, the qualifications a deacon candidate must embody are both liturgical and pastoral in nature. I quote, Deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mysteries of the faith with a pure conscience, end quote. Sounds easy. But I can tell you from experience it's not. I also believe over time women candidates to the diaconate had to also meet these stringent qualifications when being tested by the hierarch, priest, and the community. These are some of the most well-known male and female deacons the Orthodox Church honors and commemorates who inspire male and female servants today. Stephen, Archdeacon and First Martyr, Prokhoros, Deacon and Apostle of the Seventy, Olympias, the Deaconess, and Phoebe, the Deaconess. If we look at the 2007 to 2021 statistics of the Church from 15 years ago to today, we find there are six times the number of ordained male deacons serving. Their primary functions are to serve liturgically and provide pastoral care support to the local priests. Liturgically, these male deacons are mainly serving at Vespers, Matins, and Divine Liturgy, and they serve at as many feast days and other services as possible. They go in and out of the sanctuary doors for sensing, petitions, entrances, intoning the gospel, processions, memorials, and prayers over water, loaves of bread, and grapes. They especially serve the hierarch if he is in attendance, holding the two and three candles, identifying the two natures of Christ, holding his service book and staff, allowing him to pray and bless freely, and assisting him with his vestments and administering communion to the faithful during the divine service. Outside of liturgy, a deacon's primary ministry is pastoral care. They visit those in need, identified by the priest and per his direction. During these pastoral care visitations, the deacon is offering the laity, holy communion, and holy unction, and someone to listen to their needs and be present for them as an ordained clergyman in the church. Unfortunately, many priests today in this difficult pandemic life do not have the ministry support the parish needs. If they even have a male deacon, that deacon is requested to do less pastoral care visitation ministry and oversee the other ministry positions of the church in need of leadership and organization. It is important to know deacons get burnt out too, not just priests. Their diaconisa or wife and the deacon's kids, the DKs, can feel neglected as well by the deacon is off serving others 
for the glory of the kingdom of God. Maybe female deacons could help. What would a woman in the church today, if she heard the call to be an ordained deaconess, like the amazing deaconesses I mentioned earlier? Today, the patriarchs and councils of the Orthodox Church are being encouraged by several groups to rejuvenate the female diaconate roles and responsibilities in the church. It is proposed to the church councils that female deacons have similar roles and responsibilities to the male diaconate under the direction of the local hierarch, with less focus on the liturgical roles and more on pastoral ones. In this rejuvenation that has been discussed for several decades, the roles and responsibilities offered are to have women go through the similar process as the male diaconate candidates. They would first receive the blessing of their hierarch to be a candidate to the diaconate, who is tested through an approved diaconate program. After completing the program, they would require the blessing of the hierarch to apply for the blessing to be ordained. And that application would include a statement that they are not seeking ordination to the presbyterate or Episcopal office. If approved, the female would then be ordained per the female diaconate right set forth by the church for deaconesses ordained in our history. If this is to happen, it is vital for the laity to comment on and the clergy to agree on a common base of roles and responsibilities for the deaconess today. This is why we seek your feedback in our workshop. These roles and responsibilities of the deacon, male and female, are thankfully up to the hierarchs and councils, as it was since 12 apostles made a decision to ordain the first seven deacons after being strongly encouraged by the Hellenists' request to meet the need of the community. This method of the people offering present-day community need feedback to the hierarchs and then being obedient to how the Holy Spirit guides their decision is the healthy tradition we should cherish, respect, and continue with as we discuss the diaconate today. I hope that search and rescue org chart of the church presented earlier opens great discussion between clergy and laity on the roles and responsibilities of the priest and the male diaconate. And I hope the discussion of the possibility of ordaining female deacons and the rejuvenation of the female role in the church today continues in a God-guided, healthy direction. If we follow our Holy Council's decisions and are obedient to them and are obedient to our hierarch's guidance, if we listen to the Church's communication and daily news, if we understand that parish life is the central preparation space for eternal life, if we participate in the Divine Liturgy and the life of the Church, we will not feel lost. We will recognize our cross in difficult times and carry it with joy and faith in the kingdom of God and his rescuing love for all mankind. However, if we do feel like a prodigal lost sheep or know of other lost sheep during this global pandemic, we should take comfort that our priests will search for us and will want to hear about those others in need. They will have the deacons and healthcare professionals there to support them. And together, as a team, they will listen, counsel, and rescue the lost. The fewer lost Christians there are today, the more people the church will have for its ministries, evangelization and outreach, telling all the nations of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, offering them the traditions of the Orthodox Church, founded in service, professing faith, offering hope, and showing Christ's love and mercy. Who knows? Maybe after these lost are rescued, they, in turn, will hear God's call to join the Orthodox Church's search and rescue teams, just like I did. 
May God open the eyes of all our hearts and minds to his will as we continue the diaconate discussion today. Thank you. And I will go right into the next one. Just to, yep, there we go. So if, uh, if you have a moment, and if you're able to, we'd like to go right into our workshop. And as I explain the workshop a little bit, um, I don't have to walk over. We have a, a QR code that you can scan, or you can go directly to the, uh, to the path uh, for, the, for the surveymonkey.com uh, that's on the Zoom screen or here live. As you do that, I'd like to define it to you. Our workshop that is totally optional to participate in. We discuss our thought. We discussed our thoughts with you. Basically, our workshop is saying, we want to hear your thoughts. We want to give you the opportunity to share what you're thinking, your feedback on the male and female diaconate. We will not share these results or contact info. Myself, as Director of Outreach, Dr. D and Dr. Helen, and the board at St. Phoebe's Center for the Deaconess and the Ocampra Board are the only ones who will see the results. And we may summarize, but these are not going to be uh, public. Our intent is to have each of those groups use this data in an informal way to strengthen the body of Christ. Simple, basic feedback so we who care about the male and female diaconate today can be have a better discussion on a deeper level. So let's look at our first question. And this one's interactive with the people that are here. And I can't see your hand up at home. But basically, is there at least one deacon serving at your parish? If you want to raise your hand, great. If you don't, that's okay. And so with the people that are here, we have half. I would say half the people here had their hand up saying that there's a deacon in, uh, in, in the, all the churches we belong to ser and serving at. Half of them have a deacon. <clears throat> Next question. Yep. Okay. Yeah. If you want to go, maybe just go back. If, if you... Uh, so it's it's uh, https uh, colon forward slash forward slash www dot surveymonkey dot com forward slash r forward slash m h l h seven x f. If you put that in your browser, you can be part of our discussion and um, can respond to our workshop questions. Okay. So we know about how many people have the deacons. So go forward. And we'll go forward one more. So the second question we ask in our workshop is, do you feel a deacon or multiple deacons serving in any size parish, large or small, can show the fullness of the Orthodox faith from a liturgical and pastoral care perspective? It's a yes or no. And if you had any other comments, you know, and the people who are here live, or if you're not able to just think, we're just asking you to think about it. And afterwards, you can be part of the discussion. This will be the QR code and the website will be available. Next question. Do you see a need for a deacon, male or, and or female, in your parish? Please check all that apply. For instance, you may see a need for both male and female deacons. Deacons. You may see a need for only a male deacon. You may see a need only for a female deacon. And you may see no need at all for a deacon. And there might be some other category that we haven't thought of. Next question. Question four. What do you envision as the most positive and effective roles and responsibilities a deacon, male and or female, can fill in a parish? Please give us your feedback. And lastly, if you want to give us your contact information, that's fine, but we don't need it. Again, I said this is a simple, informal, just a way to get the pulse of uh, where people who are here today in the conference and people who are home watching and uh, people around this time in our life, where they're at in the diaconate discussion. Yep. I was going to wrap it up with that one. Yep. 
Uh, go forward, yep, go forward. And one more. So if you'd like to uh, speak to us uh, personally, myself, Dr. D, or Dr. Helen, uh, please reach out and contact us if you didn't feel comfortable uh, putting in your information. Uh, we're always going to be there to try to respond back to you as promptly as possible because we care about the diaconate discussion today. If we could go back to that slide, we'd like to open it up if it's possible. I don't know if we've gone over on our time. To the, to the, if anyone has any comments, they'd like to come to the microphone or if anybody who home is listening wanted to comment on. And the panel will be more than happy to discuss. But we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to. There's a microphone in the center of the conference if anybody would like to come up and comment on the male and or female diaconate today. Anything online? I don't know if there's anything online. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, you do? Yep. Well, I, I guess, um, I mean, I think, the, well, I think you started to cover some of this, but what concretely has to happen? Oh, what concretely has to happen for the female diaconate to be uh, validated and opened up? I mean, in other words, what are the steps within the church that have to occur for that to happen? Just, just you know, for somebody uneducated about that, even though my twin sister is, you know, right there, sure. <laughs> I still don't know. And maybe others have that same question. Yes, and, and you know, what's, thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. The question was, if you didn't hear it, you know, what, is, what are the concrete steps today that, that maybe we can make to in our discussion of, of the female diaconate? We did touch upon them, some of them in our talk. And what was beautiful too in the plenary uh, uh, talk earlier this morning, this, this was kind of discussed a little bit as well. It, it's, it's a natural, organic uh, method that the church has always used. And it, it has started from the beginning when the Hellenists murmured, you know, and uh, maybe all of us today, especially in work, you know, you know, murmurers, you know, maybe at work or, you know, maybe that's not the best way to accomplish something. Is, is, but, you know, today I would say a healthy discussion a natural, organic discussion that's guided, that's basically centered in love and centered in Christ. And if we, if uh, women who maybe are afraid to talk about it, we're hoping our talks like ours or in discussions that we have at these kind of conferences, we hope that in talking to priests and hierarchs, that uh, the more people that give the feedback, the more people discuss, the more specifically women who, who tell of their call, tell of their feelings to their priest, to their hierarch, the more that women that do that, the, the, I think that that gives more data for the hierarchs to make a decision like the first, uh, like the 12 did with the first seven. Uh, let's, you know, so if the more data and, and uh, spiritual love and, and, uh, that we give to the hierarchs to make the decision in these councils, uh, th that's, that's the natural way we should use. And, and that that's really is the concrete value of our church. And whether it happens tomorrow or, you know, 20 years from now, Helen, Dr. Helen, Dr. D, and myself, um, we've, we know that, yes, we want to discuss the diaconate today, but the reason why we're even up here is to support the male and female deacons of the future. And, and we're going to do that in a natural, organic way. So I, that, I would say all three of us would say uh, verbalize in, in a loving way you know, if you feel called to be a deacon or a deaconess, that's the way to do it. From grassroots, you know, it, it's a, that's how uh, the, the male diaconate program, at least I can speak from Holy Cross Hellenic College, our diaconate program has been a very natural and organic um, grassroots program that has, we've seen over the past 15 years. We're celebrating our 15 year anniversary. Over the past 15 years, uh, we've, we've grown in fellowship and brotherhood and, uh, and there's uh, Great fellowship throughout the throughout the archdiocese, uh, and and you see it grow organically. And we hope that happens to the female diaconate as well, based on God's guidance and the hierarch's guidance. Thank you for your question. Yes. 